All right, we're on page 74 in Lamed Bet. We did Maran on the top, Tet and Yud. We did both of those. So now we're just continuing in the Halakha Bua. So we were speaking last week about there needing to be a vessel above and a vessel below. I did my research, by the way. According to the Makubalim, it's not the end of the world if there's not a vessel below. What's most important is to have a vessel above. Um, regarding the vessel below, I saw some of the Makubalim, they write that it should be like a dirty, broken vessel. It shouldn't be like the, the fanciest uh, thing you have. Today that we use sinks, I don't think this is so so um, prevalent anyways. But let's see here on Lamed Bet, on page 74. Muta once permitted, he told the Adaim to wash his hands. B'makom midron. This word, I want an exact English translation. One more. We have our dear friend, Google Translate. Madron is, let's say, the, like, the side of a hill. Kind of like, nobody's walking over there. It's the end of the... The hill Shen Bnei Adam Ovrim Alehem that people do not walk over this water. Ola Tochayam, you're also allowed to pour this water into the ocean. Ola Tochanaha, or into the river. Then Sarich, and one does not need, she told to pour your hands into the Toch Klitachton Dafka. You don't specifically need a bottom vessel. You just need to be pouring your hand into the water into somewhere that. It's not going to stick around your house or anything like that. I'll say the truth is the next halakha. I know why it's here, but it doesn't really help us. It's here because of something that was said regarding my Acharonim, but I don't know for us. I'll read it to you anyway. We do not wash our hands for shacharit al gabay kisamin on sticks of wood. Why? What? How? No. Just look. You have sticks of wood. Don't wash your hands on top of them. No. Seems to be that by my machonim, the ruach ra'a only reaches the water once it hits the ground. And some people do. They would put like sticks and they would wash the my machonim there so that uh, don't even ask me why. But here by intilat yadaim, it's already ruach ra'a from your hands, so you shouldn't get your sticks. Covered in rachra. Well, they might, have, you know, they might have thought of that because in the old days, everybody had a wood pile next to the house for the firewood. Could that be? And then maybe they sometimes they wash their hands out outdoors next to the wood pile. I mean, that's possible. Like that. And then, and if you burning this wood. <laughs> oh, here Moshe Chaim is out of trouble. <laughs> that was mazik. Come on. <laughs> Oh, the no. lifestyle was different in the old days. Yeah, yeah, the wood pile next to Let's that. not mess with the musicians. I'm not here. I would pile. Yeah. Well, near the house anyway. Somewhere near the house. Yeah. What? For winter, especially winter time. There's a pile of wood there. Trying to do some reasoning. Yeah. No, let me. The source of this halacha is in the Magen Avraham. Comment there in the Shulchan. Let me just look it up for you. Sometimes the, the firewood would be, some of it would be inside the house. So we have to call it from the outside. Mm-hmm. There would be a small pile inside the house as well. So they could throw it in the stove. Dry. Yeah. 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 I went to school in a country school and he had three wooden stoves, the old fashioned. We had to put wood in it. Mm-hmm. That's the only heat we had in the building in the wintertime when it, get, when it got cold and down in the 30s, that was, 20s. That was <laughs> and, uh, we would wait for the 50 minute break just so we'd go near the stove and warm up. <laughs> yeah. No country school. No Mexican school. Oh. In Texas, when when uh, uh, Jim Crow law was still in existence, mm-hmm. and that that Mexican school was up to the fourth grade, and then you could go with everybody else after that. <laughs> uh, I lived with Jim Crow a little bit as a kid. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. I remember that stuff. My dad used to drink beer. Only the Anglos were allowed inside to drink beer inside the bar. 
the Mexicans had a drink on the outside. They had a side of the wall that would go up and they would pop it up with, with long sticks it's amazing that people don't, and they had a drink outside. <laughs> it's amazing that people don't talk about the, the effect that Jim Crow laws had in the Latino community. Well, say what it had to the black community. Yeah, well, that's even worse for them. It was even worse for them. Right, I know, but it's like, you know, it's kind of people skip the part of history. Yeah, they forget about it. It's, yeah. a, it's an embarrassing part of American history. Okay, just, just accept it for me that you don't want to get your wood or your sticks all the Ruach Rad. Okay, you don't want to get it all full of this evil spirit. That you washed your hands with them for in the morning. I mean the leftover water. You're not allowed to derive benefit from them. You can't use them for anything for yourself. Therefore, you shouldn't give it to your animals to drink. Or to the chickens and birds. And the water that you use to wash your hands with. Can you throw the stone on the ground, or what are you supposed to do with it? Like in the old days, what did they do? Throw it on the ground? Somewhere where people didn't walk. And river and sea. And therefore, you shouldn't water your plants with them. What? What a problem. We have a sewage system. We don't know what to travel and you should not wash anything with this. Like, don't use it. Oh, it's really what it is. It's just rah rah water. My hands aren't really dirty. So I'll wash all my vegetables and then, and then I'll throw it away. No, says the, the Shulchan mem. You cannot receive any kind of benefit from them. We're taking this rah rah very seriously. It's not going to go anywhere useful for you. Okay. This next halakha. Midat chasidut. It's an extra level of piety. What does that mean? Additional. No extra. It's not a halakha. It's an extra. If you want to go extra. Shalom levarech. Not to make brachot, blessings. Or to read Kriya Shema. Or to pray. Or to say Tehillim. Or to learn Torah. Or to learn Torah. Or to learn Torah. Or to learn Torah. In front of that water. They used to wash their hands. So you can't pray. Or, no, you can. You can. You just shouldn't. The extra level of piety is not to do anything holy in front of that water. The Mekubalim say that the impurity of this water is worse than that of urine. That's what the Mekubalim write. But we can uh, put a little bit of water to this sink and... Right, you can wash away the water in the sink. Here we're talking, forget the sink, the sink is good. Here, let's say you wash into like a, a, a bucket or something. I mean, we can't or play bowl. in the room where the sink. You can, yes, yes. Good question. And if you're unable to pour out the water, you should cover the water. And then you should bless. Or then get involved in things that are holy. Meaning you should first cover them. And if you can't cover them, what do you do? You're allowed to bless or, or do anything holy in front of them. You're allowed to. Why? Because at the end of the day, this is the halakha. From here, we can learn another thing. That if Ruach Ra is worse that, than a urine, then if you cover the toilet, can you pray? I mean, for the people in jail, for example, it would be relevant. Yeah. They have a Everything toilet in, in the, the room, cell. Yeah. but it's covered. So if you cover, can you pray in this room? It's, uh, I don't think they can sing. It's not as bad as a Ruach Ra. 
The term the chida, this is the chida who says that it's worse than here. Yeah, the, the term he uses is tmeim yuter. They're more impure. I don't know if that means that halachically they're worse or just kabbalistically they're worse. Regarding the people in jail, it's a great question. Because they come out and they urine or in the sink or all in the cell. Yeah. They Next don't to have the any other <laughs> place to play. Yeah, so I guess you can cover it up with a towel. Have an extra towel. I don't know if that work. We'd have to look up the halachot of where you're allowed to pray and not allowed to pray. Because over there, you know, in the olden days, they had a bucket in the corner of the room. They have to go so far to jail. That was how it was. So what was their solution? We have to look into that. I don't want to tell you an answer off that. And don't let that a bucket, you're right. For now, stay out of jail, everybody, okay? (laughs) (laughs) But you know, jail is a terrible system. Already there? It's a terrible system. In halakha, there's no such thing as a jail. It doesn't it. Either you punish somebody, you rehabilitate somebody, you kill somebody, or you let them go. You don't keep a human being locked up for years and years and years. It doesn't help anything. It doesn't help them, it doesn't help the world, it doesn't change anything. It just makes things worse. And um, unfortunately, this country has more people in prisons than any other country in the world. That's true. They're now trying to pass new laws to release certain people from prison. And I see I get all these like neighborhood alert watches. And, no, it's terrible. We're going to have more criminals on the street. Don't it's so easy to go to prison in this country that it doesn't... I mean, I'm it not so worried about it. What? It takes too long to apply the death penalty. The death penalty. There's no deterrence. Yeah. Not when Everything. <laughs> the death penalty nowadays is absolutely wrong thing because we don't have some headline. You're right. Yeah. And if we don't have death penalty, then... What to do with the criminal? No, but the secular courts have the have the authority. And authority to what? For death penalty. Yeah. From their perspective. Yeah. There's a book, Rabbi. The no, there's a book. From perspective, we have to defer to the secular authorities too. There's a book written by Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, Tzitz Eliezer, called Datum Dina, Religion and the State. And this is his theory of how you would operate a state, a modern state of Israel today, according to Halakha. Oh. I don't have the book yet, but I'm sure that in there he he discusses this matter. Really, do we not have the authority? Maybe we do. Maybe you don't need San Hedlin. Maybe. I don't know. Because, Is there an English uh, one here? Only San Hedlin, we believe, doesn't mistake. And all other courts has a certain percentage of mistake. <clears throat> so in, in the state of Israel, so for the, it's for that reason the they don't have the death penalty. Mm-hmm. But I thought the Sanhedrin would refer capital cases to the Romans. No, 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 not in our laws. <laughs> Maybe that's a nice story to get us out of Yeshu, but <laughs> no such thing by us. We're not allowed to refer anything to the secular courts. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, you have no choice. No choice, somebody doesn't want to come to a rabbinic courts, what do you do? Mm-hmm. What can you do? By the prison system, if you ever think about it, just cages full of people and people and people and people. And people and for what? For what purpose? It doesn't makes them harden criminals. Yeah. Repeat offenders. Uh, Israel doesn't have the death penalty, right? That's correct. Right. right now, they don't. So just lock everybody up like we do here in the U.S.? All the head are locked up and released for what you do with the South Arabs. They're just in jail forever. Well, then they unless, the unless they're Muslims, house. then they get switched out every once in a while. For a dead body or something. Keep them until they're very old. <laughs> but I, I want you to think about this. In, in Halakha. They don't keep them. They go out and they kill again. In Halakha. No somebody who steals from somebody else. Mm-hmm. I'd say he's a... Swindles some guy out of $30,000. So according to Halakha, he doesn't sit in prison. He pays the money back. Sometimes at a double. Sometimes at a 
The percentage depends on what it is that he did wrong. And if he's unable to pay back, he doesn't go to prison. He also doesn't declare bankruptcy. He goes to work for the person who he owes money to. Let's, let's explain to you what this means. When you read a lot of times the last slaves, slaves are not not so much that there was this black market or this, you know, people would go and they'd buy and sell. Most slaves were slaves who were put in that situation because they were decreed to by the Bedin, by a rabbinic court. Imagine the following scenario. Some guy cheats a certain company out of, like I said, $30,000 a year. Once. He did it once. $30,000. Today they make him sit in trial. This, that, the next thing. It'd be from 20 years. Who knows how long he'd be. And then what do you do? And then what do you do? 20 years. The guy, then they put him in prison for another 15 years. And then he comes out of prison. And then what? He can't go back to life. He missed 15 years of this world. Right. He was locked in a cage for 15 years. Mm-hmm. So what do you expect he's going to do? Right. He's, he has none of the record. He's a criminal. So what's he going to do? He so he, he just can't get a job. So he's going to go back to making money the way he did before. Sure. So what does he do? Then they'll catch him again. And they'll put him in prison for another 15 years. Mm-hmm. Then another time, then he'll die in prison. Right. Well, so no In our system, we don't believe that you punish without rehabilitating. And if it is something that you're unable to rehabilitate, so unfortunately... That's when the death penalty comes in. Mm-hmm. But it's a very rare occurrence. Like the Rambam tells us that a Bedin who kills somebody once every 70 years is uh, considered a murderous Bedin. And I'll give you the example. So this guy cheats out of $30,000. He has to go get a job. Well, what's the job? I don't know. This guy needs an employee. This year he was going to hire I don't know, a secretary. He was going to hire a, a, a schlepper, you know, somebody to carry the boxes from the trucks into the store and to unload them and to pack them on the shelves. <laughs> so this guy has an obligation to the Bedin to work for this person until he makes it back in what he would make as a salary, until he makes it back for the person who he owes. In which case, this person is not locked away from society. He's not shut off from the world. He's actually obligated to go to the person who he swindled. Yeah. Now that person has the option to, to opt out of it. I don't want. I don't want this guy anywhere near me. That does not force to take him. <clears throat> but he now has. He gets his money back. He means one year if he doesn't have to pay salary to somebody. And this person gets rehabilitated. Either he learns a trade or he's being productive. Not to society, but specifically to the person who he damaged. <clears throat> and then, who knows? Maybe he'll keep a job. Maybe he'll use this skill set somewhere else. And what we believe is a Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us a way to rehabilitate a person. Even the Torah talking about rape. And that's a very unpopular part of the Torah. And I'm not saying whether how a Bedin would operate today and the way the world works. <clears throat> a lady who was raped in the times of the Torah, I'm not putting down anybody who's divorced, but not so far away from a lady who was divorced. Which means in the Torah, she's probably never going to get married again. Because like you see in the Torah, a person being married before, having relations before, seems to be a deal breaker for most people in biblical times to get married again. So a lady who's raping, she did nothing wrong. She was walking down the street, whatever happens, happens. And this, this guy is a terrible person. Whatever reason he has, it doesn't make a difference. He harmed another person. So what's the option? Some people, well, they're going to put him in prison again. For how long? Who knows? Unfortunately, rapists got out of prison very quickly here, in this country. Mm-hmm. And the Torah says, no, he has a few options. One of those options is to pay a fine, uh, some kind of financial compensation, which imagine that it's not so little money. It's kind of the equivalent of supporting the person who you damaged. Not you, Khalil. Somebody damaged. That could pay for therapy. That could pay for starting a new life somewhere else. It's a significant sum of money. It's not, you know, it says like 50 shekel. I don't remember how exactly what it is. It's not, a, you know, $50. It's, it's a lot of money. Well, it seems like a small amount. It, but it's, it, really, it's not a small it, amount. It's like a life, a lifelong a uh, annuity almost. Yeah. Right? And then on top of that, she, not he, she has the choice to marry this person if she wants. Now, what kind of lady in the world would marry her rapist? 
Let's assume a few things. Most rape are not random occurrences in the street. Unfortunately, most rape are either people that they know, people who are in proximity to them in their life. Not always. Yes, no, could be. But it could be that this lady says, I don't have any chances to get married. And the Bedin says, this person obviously has to fix his act. And you don't know, we don't know what guidance the Bedin made a person go through before he was able to make the decision. But she might say, I don't stand a chance. If I want to think, if I want to try on my own, I have the right to go find somebody that I want. <clears throat> but if not, at least this person, I have to get married to. That means someone to support me, someone to take care of me. It might not be the most romantic way to get married, but at a practical level, it does one more thing. When a person rapes another person, it's not let's get off and go to jail and, and that's it. Rather, you might not, he might be stuck for a lifetime married to the person who he made into his victim. Mm. He cannot do it. Mm. Right. And this, this is a very big dissuader for someone who wants to rape. Mm. Because chances are the person who's raping doesn't want to be in a committed relationship, and definitely not that kind of committed relationship. And therefore you see that there's something deeper here. It's not, oh, he rapes, so all she is is worth 50 shekels. It's not the story here. The story here is we need to find a way, one, to help the victim, financially and even offering her a spouse, and two, rehabilitate this person, or at least scare off a potential rapist from attempting to do something that when he will get caught, he's going to ruin his life for. It's not a sentence. It's not a matter of money. It's a matter of, does he want to waste the rest of his life married to somebody when that's not exactly what he was doing? It would be better for him to go you find someone consensual. Bad, you got a bad thing with kind of a parity <clears throat> in force. These things. What I'm trying to show though is the following. When you find punishment in Jewish law, mm. it's meant to rehabilitate and to help the victim. Both. You don't find that in today's legal system. That's not the point. The point is not to rehabilitate the person. Making license plates in prison is not going to rehabilitate anybody. No. And Hanging out with all the criminals together in the same place all day long, all day night, is not going to help anybody. It's definitely not doing anything for the victim. Yeah. And for the victim, what does the victim get out of it? So the victim, you get some... So now what? The guy's going to send to prison. Maybe on a revenge level, that might feel good for a few days. But on a practical level, so what does it get back for him? Nothing. It doesn't help anything. All you ever hear about on on uh, on TV with these in the news is that the the victims say like, "Oh, we we're getting some sense of closure." That's the only sentence you ever hear. Some sense. What, what's of closure. the point of that closure? What's the point of the closure? I'm not taking away the importance of closure, but closure could come in different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, even another and more extreme scenario: What if somebody kills somebody else? Not intentionally. What is not intentionally? I mean, it could mean a variety of things. Excellent. It's it's accidental manslaughter, which in this country somebody could serve their whole life in prison for doing something like that. In this country, by the way, you could serve not you, a person could serve their whole life in prison for doing just about anything. There's nothing really here that that this is okay. And sometimes you know, a person never knows. Yeah, there's like three strikes, uh, pizza sell, pizza yeah. thieves, and. Uh, and so what happens to this person? He has the opportunity to run away. Yeah. Run away where? City of it's a city of refuge. In Irmikad, you have to know what is a city of refuge? <clears throat> a city of refuge is a Jewish community. It has shuls, it has day schools, it has yeshivot, it has everything else. For people who are made a serious mistake, where one, someone out there is going to try to get revenge. <clears throat> and so the, the, the government must offer that person protection. That's one. Protect here not just the victim, but the criminal, the one who did something wrong. And two, it offers a place where really a person has to go away for life. But they're not cut off from the world. They're not cut off from... They can get married. They can have children. They can build a family. At the end of the day, they did one thing wrong, and that means that they're, they're stuck. They're stuck in this place for their life. That's a bad enough... What? Yeah, there's a, the mother of the Queen Gadol is the one who takes care of them. It's kind right. of a... So, and Levine were teachers of the Torah. Exactly. Rabbis, right? The whole point was to help these people come back to a normative way of life. Mm. And when I look at society, I say, wow, look, we're in the year 2014. And how much have we actually done in the criminal justice system, as they call it, to rehabilitate criminals and to help victims? Nothing. 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 
And someone gets caught for selling drugs, they put him in prison, they put him in but he's in prison, he makes more context on who to buy drugs from and who to sell drugs to. Maybe instead he should take this person out and force him to go to... You want to give him a six-year sentence? Six years in rehab. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Make, them, make them work in Africa. Or, or make, do something. Do something productive. Yeah. Or make them make really train them in a trade. Right. Really Most really people who are selling drugs, it's an easy way to make money. Right. Most people who sell right. drugs are victims of other people who got them into selling drugs. I'm not talking here about your big, you know, mafia bosses. Where the what happened? Four or five, they take off the business. <laughs> and then come back to work. Really? The whole, the whole system is a problem. Mm-hmm. And we as Jews, How do you so we don't. Those kind of guys. They're in jail, all kind of things. But they won't. It's a, but that's also a good thing. It's also a good thing. Yeah. We have to, we're so angry at criminals. Ah, it's good. This person served their life. Do you know what I mean? life in prison. Aside from you, you have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. Aside from that, yeah, it's not. Think about that. Right? And as much as it costs nowadays, yeah, it's as much yeah. that's paying well, for college, college cost university. Oh, oh yeah, well, you hear what Rule said? That that you might as well pay for them to go to college. Uh, yeah. Forty thousand. Have college for criminals. No, they do have it. I believe they can in in prison. In prison, yeah. though. But I'm talking yeah. about outside yeah. of prison. It doesn't help somebody to get stuck in. I mean, Harvard and Stanford cost sixty five thousand dollars a year, so it's like ninety thousand dollars to be a criminal. And so what do they sit there watching TV all day and movies and and walk? around in a cement building and for what? They, they privatize a lot of the prisons and a lot of our big politicians own stock in those countries. Absolutely. <laughs> the whole thing is, is corrupt. Yeah. And I, so wait, what's the better option? Judaism has better options. We're offering better things to the world. So you want to modernize some of these ideas? So it's not 50 shekels. So it has to be putting this person through therapy, putting this person into a new apartment, into a new life, whatever it is you feel. That, but at least take the principles and help people out. And you don't have to be an anarchist or a liberal. Or, you don't have to be one of those to believe in this. You have to just believe in the Torah. You don't find the Torah saying, oh, let's put a person away forever. Period. What kind of, what kind of idea is that? Well, that's really interesting. Because I always used to say, ah, even if these reformed Jews or secular Jews, they always fight for justice. They're lawyers. They do a lot of good. And then I just realized, they never think of this. We they never think of that. Further. <laughs> the true Torah um, is in the Torah. Yeah, you'll be amazed if you study. Put aside the halachot between us and God for a moment. Mm-hmm. What we offer the world in the between God, man and man department, it far surpasses anything that the greatest mm-hmm. philosophical schmendricks in university come up with. These geniuses, these uh, academics, these, uh, they they're still working on things that we figured out three thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just so what took you so long to be a psycho? How many years you have to study to be a psychologist? Seven years. I'm not taking away from psychologists. But you know, how many years of research do you do? Two years, I don't know, three years. Huh? And how much of your knowledge is based on research? How old is the research you're studying? 40 years, 30 years. Well, you're talking about Jewish psychology books that go back 2,000 years, 2,500 years, 1,000 years. A really modern book, 800 years. I mean, they tested psychology on people and say, why is the world so stuck? Because the world doesn't know, because we didn't teach it to them yet. Because chances are, we don't even know it ourselves. You come to all kinds of parishot in the Torah and they make you cringe. Oh my God, it sounds so barbaric, so brutal, so... And then stop for a moment and open the Rambam's Moran of Uchim. What is his spin on this? Most of what I told you here is from the Rambam. Most, not everything. What is it trying to do? What's the message it's trying to bring out? And then you'll be blown away and say, Hashem, your Torah, that's it. It's the only thing this world needs. Mm. But if we're not convinced about it, nobody else is going to be convinced about it. Yeah. You know, the Christians, they study Tanakh. They don't even, they don't even pick up like on the whole, they're reading, I don't know what they're reading. It's a nice, it's like, it's like, it's how unfortunately most Jews read Chumash. It's very superficial, very, you know, we glaze it over, we pass it over. I mean, this is the, the blueprint of the world that HaKadosh Baruch gave us. God wrote this book. How do you have God wrote a book and you don't have one commentary on it? 
I sometimes I see these guys with the, with the Old Testament. They're reading it. Sometimes they got these fancy color coded. But there's not what. Where's the the meat behind the stuff? They don't have a footnote in, in the Re- Christian Bible. Isn't that amazing? Not a footnote. Isn't that amazing? Commentary. As much as I, I I dislike the Art Scrolls commentary, but look how beautiful it is. Yeah, Everything has a reason. Everything has an idea where it comes from. Things are all connected to each other. There's musala skill. There's ethics that come out of these things. They never produced even one. Rashi. We're not. We're not. Yeah, we're not even like in competition over here. We're the only people who read Tanakh. Hopefully. Mm-hmm. We have to teach that Torah to the world. We have a legal system that is incredible. Incredible. It's no surprise the people who study Dafka, that area of Torah, they get blown away by it. In the financial area, you'll be amazed at what goes on over there. How to operate businesses, how to deal with fraud. How to all kinds of... Halachot, halachot, halachot. You have so many things about it. You know, it's sad in a way because we make we make so made so much impact in so many areas of of the world, and the idea that we you know and we're credited for it. You hear different you know uh, non-Jews you know saying, "Oh, Jews contributed this, Jews contributed that." And occasionally, we've got these fancy right. reports about how Mark Twain marveled at this right, right. about all the Jews, and then other people say, "Well, look, this this guy would not have been." You know, if he doesn't want to support Israel, then he's got to give up, you know, his pacemaker and get this, you know, and this laser surgery and all sorts of stuff. And the thing is, is that, you know, the, uh, we, we've made these inroads in science and medicine, but with law, even though we're credited for it, you can see like the Talmud's reference on the Supreme Court building and all this, but we're just, when it comes right down to it, it's like we, our real system hasn't been, hasn't been, uh, Embraced or disseminated. It's true. Our it's system, our philosophy. Greek philosophy and their mindset. Yeah. Look at all the universities, look at all their. The philosophical underpinning is not Torah. Absolutely, and it's very hard to study Jewish philosophy. Like those of you in my Kuzari class, it's hard to study Jewish philosophy with a Greek head. Right. It's very hard. But even more than that, I think the problem is that most Jews don't appreciate what it would be like to live under such a system. And I'll tell you, I, I speak about this in my Monday class often. Most of us, rightfully so, are kind of relieved that, let's say, the state of Israel is, to some extent, a separate church and state entity. Because, trust me, those guys running around in Mashali, I don't want those guys giving me prison sentences, right? Like, uh, oh, you have an iPhone, that's 3,000 years in prison, you know, you know with, with hard Gemara study. Who knows? Like, that's, that's, I, I, don't, I don't trust those people to be the upstanding moral beacons of light to the way that the justice system so those guys are just as crazy yeah. they throw out rocks and right. I'm pretty sure that if we put those guys in power not just the guys from Mashallah but in general your average uh, I, don't, I don't want to sound bad your average orthodox rabbi if we would put him in charge of a legal system our legal system will look not so much different than what's going on in ISIS in the Middle East because yeah. we also behead people and we also stone people technically if you don't know how to use the system properly if you don't understand the beauty of the way halakha works properly, and unfortunately most people don't, they can barely make it through the laws of kashr. Now you're going to put them ahead of the laws of, of you know, capital punishments. That's not a good idea. But I think that we have not ever stopped for a moment and said, so we're happy, well, thank God, there's a separation of church and state, you could be religious, not religious, whatever you want, fine. But that's because we've never formulated in our head, so what would a state of Israel look like if we ran it according to Torah law, what would it look like? I was having a discussion with my wife. Everyone's in these religious people in Israel. They're telling me, oh, we can't believe in the state of Israel because it doesn't follow Torah law. I said, your interpretation of Torah law? Thank God the state of Israel doesn't follow it. But the real question is, have you ever sat down, have you written books of legal code, how a modern day, not 2,000 years ago, a modern day country, that's not made up of just religious Jews who went to the Mir Yeshiva, would operate in today's world with technology, with international relations, with warfare, with global communities. Have you ever thought about it for a moment? Beyond the very juvenile level of, okay, let's make the rabbis the prime minister. Like that's, You have to think about these things. And I don't think that we as a religious community have seriously given this topic much thought. We have not sat down with our Gemaras and our Shulchan Aruchs and the Rambams and, and said, let's figure out the way the system would work. 
the Ben Mikdash. I'm not taking it away. Yeah, but it's kind of like the Ben Mikdash project, though. It's like the, it's like the uh, Temple Mount uh, Institute or whatever. Sure, someone has it's to like do it now, so they'll be ready for all that too. And that's a huge, Especially in one a huge project. Have made this kind of contribution in the legal system, and that's the rabbis who work out the rules of war for the IDF. Because I find them, you know, they, they really are head and shoulders above any other military on earth. So, and apparently, they're very careful about everything. Try it. Try it. It's war. At the end of the day, war is a war. No, no, no. But the, but the rabbis, they, they go by what the rulings of these rabbis. Not only just for missing soldiers, dead soldiers, nobody. You know, the Mossad the rules of has a chief rabbi? Wow. Hmm. Yeah. We don't know much about him because he's the chief he's rabbi of the Mossad. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do you know who the chief rabbi is? <laughs> you know, the, the chief rabbi of the Mossad, he probably doesn't even know he's the chief rabbi of the Mossad. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's very special that you have a state of Israel that as secular as you might want to call it, has a very big respect for religion somewhere in its heart. Whether it struggles with it all the time, as and most you know secular Jews do. But it's an interesting thing. And, and I wonder, why haven't we gotten our act together? And forget the world. The global community can wait for a second. But in the, the Jewish community, in the, in the inner walls of the Bimidrash, Midrash, why don't we have contributions to the way a government would operate in 2014? And there are. There are a few rabbis. Like I told you, Rabbi Waldenberg, Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, the student of Rabbi Uzziah, wrote a book also on halakha and government. And we have a few volumes of these kind of works, but they've been shunned. In the case of Rabbi Waldenberg, he was the chief rabbi of the Shari Tzedek Hospital. Uh, a brilliant mind, very accepted in the Orthodox community. Even though, even though he was argued against by many people for some of his more novel uh, suggestions. Remember Rabbi Rosenbaum was here? My rabbi? Yeah. He was given a class about abortion in Halakha. Mm-hmm. There was one rabbi who permitted abortion in certain cases. And he spent the whole hour disproving that rabbi. That rabbi who permitted was Rabbi Waldenberg. He just didn't want to mention his name, so it was not to embarrass Rabbi Waldenberg. Rabbi Waldenberg passed away like five years ago, not so long ago. I just last week I married it to buy the set of books I've been waiting my whole I've been learning them, but not in my own library. Either in the yeshiva or my friends' books, I finally was able to get myself a complete set of his writings. Aside from this volume on the reason they sell it separately, this is exactly what I was telling you. After he passed away, they found many manuscripts of his that he had not yet published. Last night I found online a first edition, I can't afford it, but a first edition of his book that he wrote when he was 19 years old. 19 years old, printed in Europe, that when he came to Israel, he later changed the way he studied and no longer wrote books in that fashion. He wrote halakhic books as opposed to Talmudic works. He kind of took a 180 degree turn of the way he learned from when he was 19 to when he became a posik. But this book, Datum Dinaz, it's a thick book. It's like an encyclopedia of Jewish law for a modern day state of Israel. And he, he's by the way the expert on like medical issues in Halakha, science in Halakha, because he was the rabbi of Shari Tzedek. He dealt with these questions all day long. The Orthodox community accepted him so much that the zealots, the anti-Zionist Orthodox movements, when they found out that posthumously, that when he passed away they published this book on the law in the state of Israel, they excommunicated the book. I have the letter. They put out the letter saying, you are not allowed to study Rabbi Waldenberg's book because he never intended for it to be published to the masses because he, even if he was a, a closet Zionist, he would have never wanted us to embarrass him by saying that publicly, and so on and so forth. And this book never comes as part of the set of any of his other works. Most people have never even heard about it because it's been shunned by much of the Orthodox community. But it's still there. It doesn't mean nobody wrote it. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, now is the time to start getting involved in this, to put together a system. You can't expect, you can't expect that we're going to go into Mashiach, we're going to go into building a religious government without having a plan for it. That doesn't look like these crazy guys in the Middle East. It has to be something put together, something that makes sense, something that's fair. What do you do in a country where... Half of your country, the majority of your country doesn't keep Shabbat. They can put, you give everybody the death penalty? Mm-hmm. That's what's going to happen? You really think so? That's what they taught you in Chumash class in fifth grade, so that's the way it's going to work? Yeah, they try it, it works. They try it a couple of <laughs> times. You know, even, even, and I'll quote him on record, but rarely, even Rabbi Meir Kahana, who, okay, is his own genre of, of literature. 
had plans for how to create a religious state of Israel, not based on radio talk shows, but based on things he wrote. He has a, a books on halakha, he has books on Jewish philosophy, in Hebrew, he has books, a commentary on Tanakh, things that most people, his political side of him was, was you know, his career, but I'm, I'm talking here about his Torah. One of the things he suggested was, if you make a religious state of Israel, it can't be just a theocracy, uh, you know, anyone who doesn't keep Shabbat, you kill him, and anyone who does this, you kill him, and what are you going to have, who's going to have left? <laughs> he said, that can't be the way it's going to happen. He suggested something radical. He said, everyone in the state of Israel, in a democratic state of Israel, has to have the option to not be observant. You can't force someone to be observant. That's not the way you're going to get the whole Jewish people to follow with Judaism. He said, but you can reverse the system. He said, public schools, you have to teach Torah in public school. He said, and somebody doesn't want their kid, they're so not wanting to study Torah studies. Let them homeschool. Let them make private schools. He said, but even private schools have a government curriculum of, of core studies they must study. He said, even if they don't want to. Judaics, that's what it's going to be. He said, and you'll reverse the coin. He said, because you can't force people. It's not the right way. And even that, and you're talking about someone who was in the world considered like from the most radical right that ever existed, understood that the whole notion of let's create a religious state, and take, that's a juvenile concept. You're, that's not going to happen. And you have to think about it in a mature fashion, in a thought-out fashion. And the only way to do it is to show the beauty of such a system to somebody else. Not by writing, not by throwing rocks on Shabbat, not by burning garbage cans. It's not going to bring about this love of the Jewish legal system. Because we have a lot to offer outside of the laws of washing our hands. But also in the laws of how to build, not a prison system that still rehabilitates people. How to deal with the rape victims that we spoke about. How to deal with murderers, how to deal with thieves, how to deal with all kinds of people. <clears throat> It's interesting that we already have a Yeshua for Kohanim preparing them for the temple, but we don't have anything for, you know, polit- Politi- politicians, lawyers. Uh, I don't think that the religious community really even believes that there could ever be such a thing. Because even those religious politicians are just as bad as everybody else. They are. They really are. And it just makes us look bad. No, uh, by politicians, I mean the... A political Jewish system. Government. Sure. Because I don't think we really believe it. <laughs> we don't really believe it. We're like, ah, oh, it's going to be like this forever. But I think a lot of that is the magical thinking that various schools mm-hmm. of Judaism teach, that the Beit HaMikdash is going to drop down. The whole, right. exactly. It in books. It's all gleaming and gold and... Gold. And a Rashi was of that opinion. Say that, uh-huh. But o- only Rashi. Right. <laughs> only Rashi. I mean, not, Rashi is not a nobody, but he's a one buddy, mm-hmm. as opposed to everybody else. There has to be a different way to it. You know, even now, I'm teaching my Monday morning class. I could share this with you. Even though I wanted to bring it as an article for you to read, but I'll give it to you anyway as an article to read. Rav Cook and Rabbi Uziel, the two chief rabbis that were together, they had a long dispute about certain things that were coming up as part of a modern state of Israel. They, they preceded the state of Israel. They did not live through the... 1948 Pope, maybe Rav Uziel did, I don't know for sure, but Rav Kook definitely didn't. And some of the issues they argued about, one had except converts, which for, for Rav Kook was like the standard Orthodox procedure today, which is it's very difficult, it takes forever, da 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 Rav Uziel was not of that opinion at all, like most Sephardic Poskim, and, and suggested otherwise. Next came the question, and I, I didn't mean to bring up the conversion, just as part of that article, autopsies. Mm-hmm. You need to have doctors in a functioning country. You can't have if someone said, oh, so we'll bring all our doctors from outside of Israel. Why would you operate your own country with your medical staff being from Jordan? And why, why would that be the solution? So, the question is, how do you study to be a doctor if, according to many Jews, performing autopsies on cadavers and studying dead bodies is considered disgracing a dead body? So what are you going to study with? Yeah. So, Rav Kook writes something which, as liberal and open-minded Rav Kook was in his Hashkafah, his halakha, unfortunately, was very different than that. And Rav Kook, and I, you know that I love Rav Kook, I'm just sharing with you what he wrote. Rav Kook writes that the notion that performing an autopsy in a body is disgracing a body is only something that a Jew believes in. He says non-Jews freely donate their body to science. And they never heard of it. You know, non-Jews do cremation, all kinds of things that happen. Says Rav Kook, imagine a human body is not innately holy, so you can't disgrace it. Like, you know, if you buy a, go to Hatikva Judaica and buy yourself a tefillin bag, before you put your tefillin in, can you throw that bag in the garbage? Mm-hmm. 
the bag? The bag, the velvet bag for your tefillin. Can you put it in the garbage? Yeah, you bought it. You didn't put your tefillin in the end. Can you put it in the garbage? It says tefillin on it and your yeah. name. Well, it, it, I believe that the tefillin are, are sacred, but the bag itself could be... What happens once you put the bag, the tefillin in the bag? Now you got a new bag. What can can you throw out the old bag? You mean do you treat it like a sacred object? Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. In the beginning, you could throw it out because even though it was designated for a whole, it doesn't it wasn't used for a whole. You could throw it out. It never rose to that level. But once you put tefillin inside right. of it, it becomes, it's then it becomes perfect. holy, and then you can't throw it out anymore. Says Rav Cook, every human being has this potential to reach a certain level of holiness. Jews actively have the Torah inside of them, and therefore, when they pass away, you can't start cutting up and slicing and dicing. Even if they give consent. They're just like, the tefillin bags just throw me away. You still can't throw it away. So if a non-Jew gives consent before he passes away, that you could use my body for science, there's no reason not to do it, says Rav Cook. But for a Jew, you're not allowed. And therefore, he suggested that if they were to establish a medical center in Israel, they should use only cadavers from non-Jewish bodies that they willingly donated themselves to science. Hmm. Rabbi Uziel not starts yet. off his letter. What? Muslim, whoever, whoever wants to. Uh, there are a lot of people who donate their bodies to science. Rav Uziel starts off his letter with the following things. God forbid that you should entertain such notions in your mind let alone write them down on paper. <laughs> That's how Rav Uziel starts his letter. <laughs> what does he really think? <laughs> Rav Uziel says that every human being is innately holy. As it says, Elohim ba'am, that God created man, not Jews, man, in the image of God. It says in Rav Kook, with all due respect, I disagree with your notion, and I believe you should never have written it down, because of the damage that such ideology can do to the Jewish people. Right. And then Rav Uziel continues, and he says, but, if you ask me, he says, who said that autopsies disgrace a dead body? He said, what if it's done in a respectful fashion, not left out to rot in the middle of a laboratory, but in a proper fashion, in a timely fashion, it's done for a specific purpose, for a certain medical study that will save other people's lives. Says Rav Uziel, Anybody can, not anybody, anybody can go through such an autopsy and it will not be violating Nivul Hamet, disgracing a dead body. And Rav Uziel suggests that if you are not allowed to do autopsies, you cannot do autopsies on Jews or non Jews because both bodies are holy. He mm. says Jews may consider themselves holy for other reasons. But one thing he says we do not have, Rav Uziel writes, he writes this clearly, he says Jews cannot claim for themselves a holier body than non-Jews. That's what Rav Uziel writes. <coughs> He's very sharp in his letter. Mm. And Rav Uziel says, and therefore I say, and he says I base my words on the fact that many of our sages were doctors, and it could not be that they studied medicine without studying dead bodies. He says, and therefore... Not only do I not see reasons to prohibit, I see reasons to permit such autopsies as long as they will help people live and contribute to the general knowledge of medicine and done in a respectful fashion. What, what did um, Rambam say? Well, we, don't have, see, we don't have, let at least I don't know that we have the Rambam actually addressing this topic, which Rav Uziel me, understands to me that it wasn't even an issue. But that's speculation. Of course they have them. But I mean, the fact that it is an issue in a lot of Judaism. According to Rav Kook. No, according to... Well, that's become mainstream, oh, that view of Rav Kook. Before that, this situation wasn't addressed. No. The autopsies weren't even... Considered. Not in Jewish law. Well, so Rav Kook really did uh, get really? Uh, set that stage for... for and as much as you may think way. Rav Kook didn't affect mainstream Judaism, this letter is another case, aside from his stance on conversion, but another stance in which he, he influenced mainstream Judaism to the point where, if you would suggest what I said from Rav Uziel, they'd think you're crazy. How many Ashtab Jews in the the body for right, so it's a problem. You know that in the state of Israel, and this, by the way, passes over then to organ donation, yeah. which is very yeah. different, by the way, than yeah, organ donation. Autopsies, because or, organ donors directly save people's lives. Yeah. It's not. It's not maybe contributing to the wealth of knowledge of science, they but do that in yeah. the so I'll tell you like this: this has been a big dispute in in the state of Israel for a very long time. And you know that there are about about. 
200 people a year who die in the state of Israel because there are not enough organs in the market yeah. to be donated. Oh, really? Because even your non-observant Jews have it in their head that if they donate an organ, they won't be resurrected in the world to come. And that concept doesn't exist in Jewish sources. There's no such thing that if you're missing an organ, God forbid, then... <laughs> Rev. Moshe Feinstein writes that, let's say he was dealing with donating a... Heart? Liver? What's the kidney? It's a kidney. Often yeah. people don't. You can, you can yeah, function with one kidney. Yeah. But Moshe Feinstein said, if you know we'll save another person's life, you have a mitzvah yeah. to donate the kidney, but not an obligation. Rav Moshe believes that saving another person's life does not come on account of losing something from yourself. In other words, you cannot force people to donate kidneys because it right. saves somebody else. But if a person wants to do so, it's a mitzvah to do so. Yeah. The main dispute is not whether or not you can donate organs. There is no such dispute in Jewish law. The question is, when is a person dead enough to donate the organ? When their heart stops beating, when their stem cell stops working, that's where the main dispute happens. And unfortunately, according to those who are very strict in this matter, very often it's too late to harvest an organ to be able to save someone else's life. And so I'm not sticking my head here between giants of halakha in either direction. But what I am sharing is unfortunately... I can say him by name. Rabbi Sachs. You know Rabbi Sachs? Yeah. Chief Rabbi of England. Jonathan Sachs. Interesting person. I'm not a, not a student. I, mean, I didn't learn by him. I know he holds high regard in a lot of circles. Seems like, unlike to be the chief rabbi of other countries, you don't have to be a, a Dayan, a, a rabbinic judge, to be the chief rabbi of most European countries, because it's more of a ceremonial position than it is a, a halachic position. Like the chief rabbi of Israel has to oversee all the rabbinic courts in Israel, which means he has to at least be capable of telling all the other rabbis in Israel what to do. Not necessarily like that in other countries. And that's okay, because most countries don't have such a system. And therefore, someone who's a high man of stature, of spiritual stature, is who leads that country. Rabbi Sachs is a man of high spiritual stature. I'm not taking it away from him. He spoke in Israel about a year and a half ago. And he said a statement at the Great Synagogue on the public. He was speaking about organ donation. And he said that... I'm just repeating it. Please don't... He said that Jews are allowed to accept organs from non-Jews, but are not allowed to donate organs to non-Jews. Mm -hmm. And the world went crazy. Because, unfortunately, many Orthodox Jews agreed with him. Not just Orthodox Jews, many Jews agreed with him. And Rabbi Moshe Tendler, who is Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's son-in-law, he's my Rosh Shiva's brother, in New York. He's the professor of, of bioethics, could be, in the Yeshiva University. He's a, a big posek. Also, he's a, a, a scientist. And he gave a shir and he says, you cannot say such things. He says, if you are allowed to donate organs, if you are allowed to receive organs, you must be allowed to donate organs. Says you cannot take organs from people and not give organs to people. So there's no such concept in Judaism. He argues directly, similarly with that letter of Rav Kook, who does make a differentiation. And Rav Moshe Teller said that if Rabbi Sachs does not take back his statement, then he's putting Jews' lives in danger around the world. Because what happens when in Israel, the people oh, we don't want our organs to go to Jews. <clears throat> and then what? So what have you created? So then thousands of people around the world can die from that. And then what? So maybe pogroms could happen again because of this. So why would you say such a thing that so one does not have halachic validity and two is just a disgusting thing what to say? Well, it's pretty obvious what he's saying. <laughs> but, but the thing is, what's the basis of him saying that just because of Rav Kook or what? No, not necessarily Rav Kook. That seems to be the common Jewish stance on the street. But I mean, what was they point to? The base of it is not fair. What What does make a lot of sense? Don't don't look at me. I, in general, I subscribe to the non-Kabbalistic, halachic, Sephardic approach to Judaism, which is that the difference between Jews and non-Jews is a conscious decision, not a innate difference that is supernatural and metaphysical and and elitist. It's not the approach that my rabbis taught me, nor is it the approach that I ever plan on taking. And that worldview. <laughs> is possibly what could redeem us in such a situation. Unfortunately, the 
mainstream Orthodox Jewry follows the mainstream Kabbalistic views, which could very much make problems in these areas of Jewish law. So it is Kabbalistic? The root of it is Kabbalistic? Not. Kabbalah doesn't say you cannot do Atat. Like, Kabbalah doesn't say stuff like that. Rather, Kabbalah, if you read it in a certain way, could make it seem that there are different levels of people and different levels of souls and different levels of all kinds of things. That's wonderful. But just because the Kabbalah says this one has this kind of soul and that one has that kind of soul, doesn't mean that this person is better than this person, or this person is entitled to something that this person is not entitled to, and so on and so forth. And it's very dangerous when we take Kabbalistic concepts mm-hmm. and apply them to Halakha, to mainstream Judaism, and to the general population who doesn't have a right to be dabbling in Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately in our world today, too many people dabble in Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. And, and the people who are dabbling in Kabbalah, one should not be dabbling in Kabbalah. Those who teach Kabbalah don't even know the first thing about Kabbalah. And they, they have all kinds of like, you know, workshops and sheets and books and all kinds of things. They teach people about different souls and heavens and spheres and dimensions. And If I would ask you how earthquakes happen, you wouldn't know what to tell me. If I would ask you how lightning is created, you wouldn't be able to tell me. So why in heaven's name are you trying to explain to me that there are ten different spheros and four different worlds and three different kinds of souls? And I'll, You don't know the first thing about this planet. So why are you getting involved in other planets? Rabbi Peretz gave a class in Jerusalem on Wednesday. I have a student who should live and be well. He, he records all the classes for me and emails them to me. So I'm very lucky that I get to hear Rabbi Peretz teach from Jerusalem. Oh, you get the audio? Yeah. yeah. And then I wonder, those people sitting in the class, like they, they miss asking the right questions. They right, ask like the stupid questions. And her parents just said like world-shattering stuff, and you ask him, oh, what's the name of that rabbi you just mentioned? Stop with the silly questions, ask him the real questions. And I'm, I'm like, I'm asking the recorder questions, and nobody's answering me back. So that's a, you know, but, but when it, he was teaching in the parish, he was speaking about something that happened. He was at a brit milah, and there was a mohel. It was a big mikubah. He said, somebody who knows, knows Kabbalah. Somebody who's not, he's not a, you know, he didn't make it up. He's a real chassid, like a real, not chassid, like with a fuzzy hat, chassid, like a righteous person. And he was at the Brit, and you know how, remember we saw the Kabbalists pray? Okay, mm-hmm. so he's saying the bracha and the milah. He goes, Baruch, Ata, and it's Hashem's name, and he's three minutes saying Hashem's name. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, the baby is crying. The baby's screaming. The baby's going nuts on the table. And he's holding the baby down. And and again, he's flipping pages in his color-coded book. And Melech HaOlam, just thinking about this. And the baby doesn't stop crying, so he takes some wine, and he puts it in the baby's mouth, and he keeps the bracha. The red parrots got up and he walked out of the breed. He said, you want to be a Kabbalist? On your own time. So the baby's crying. So he's strapped down to a table when he's crying. He said, you stop in the middle of a bracha to give him wine, instead of just hurrying up and doing the brit. He said, Kabbalah and Halakha, when they intersect, Halakha takes precedence, even if you're a Kabbalist. <clears throat> even if you're a Kabbalist. And I know that's not fun for most people who want to float around on magic carpets. You know, the Zohar, I, cannot, I don't have a right to speak about the Zohar. But the parts of the Zohar, which were written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, infer from what I said anything you want to hear. The parts of the Zohar that were written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when they argue with the Talmud, why is it that the Talmud takes precedence? Or why should the Talmud take precedence? The majority of rabbis. Very nice. The Talmud was written by the majority of rabbis. The Zohar was written by one rabbi. And therefore it's a simple Jewish law. Even though Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai may be the greatest tzaddik who ever lived, even he agrees to the rule that when he argues with everyone else, you follow everyone else. Mm-hmm. Because that's the will of Hashem. Hashem made up that rule, mm-hmm. not us. That's Hashem's rule. Yechid v'rabim. Halakha k'rabim. You follow the majority. And so I, the, the, the Jewish, I, I God forbid will not say contaminated by Kabbalistic ideas, but, but has been... Or permeated. The wrong people are teaching Kabbalah and then trying to follow it. <clears throat> We're and, infiltrated. <laughs> and, and it's a sad thing. And then all of a sudden you have a person, like, like I told you, they don't even know about themselves. And now they're an expert in what kind of soul Jews have, and what kind of soul non-Jews have, and what kind of soul animals have, and what kind of planets, plants come from, and rocks, and then they start comparing the different ones, and because of that, so really I should do this. Stop. Hosh Baruch says there's one people on this planet, they're humans. There are Jews, Jews have a purpose. We have a purpose on this planet. We're not, we're not the same like the Goyim, we're not. That's because of our purpose. And if you would like to see what the Kabbalah says about Jews who don't follow their purpose... 
<laughs> you thought what it said about non-Jews was one thing? You wait till you read what it says about the Jews who don't keep Shabbat. Or the ones who don't keep kosher. Or those who don't eat the three meals on Shabbat with the right mindset. Or those who pray without saying the right names of Hashem in the right direction. And you'll be blown away. <clears throat> Rabbi Yosef Karo. Man. There's a book that he wrote, Magid Meisharim. Remember I quoted you this book once? Remember what it was? The angel that talked with him? <laughs> Very nice. The angel stops coming to Maran. You know why? The angel says you are excommunicated from heaven. Maran, Maran it's not a me or you. It's a Maran. Says, why? He says, because the other day when you came to pray with sunrise... You came late. How late? A few seconds late. A few. A few seconds. And because of that, he's excommunicated to heaven. Someone wants to live their world according to Kabbalah, oh, it's not such a simple game. It's not all about worlds and dimensions. Man. It's about a lot of big stuff. And because of that, we have the simple approach to Yadud. It's very sophisticated. But it's the way that we all have to go on. And then we can get there. How do we get to all this? Because Rav Uziel is not a fanatic. Rav Uziel is simply stating what normative Judaism states. Unfortunately, normative Judaism today is considered radical, and radical Judaism is considered normative. Take, for example, what's going on in Israel right now. I hope if we don't finish the Shulchan Ruch today, it's not going to be the end of the world. Israel right now, the biggest debate going on in Israel? Jewish state. Not just the Jewish state, there's one specific problem that's going on. Okay. <clears throat> That was last week. This week. <laughs> no, this new one. It's a new one. Jews always have problems. We... There's a certain mountain in Jerusalem. No. There you go. This mountain of Jerusalem. Harabite, the Temple Mount. Where we've been praying to go pray at for the last 2,000 years since we were thrown off of there. And somehow, the world has painted it that the consensus of rabbis is that you are not allowed to go up to the Temple Mount. Yeah, Rabbi Vadi Yosef said you're not allowed to go to the Temple Mount. Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, the chief rabbi today of Sephardic State of Israel, the Rishon Tzion, said that anyone who goes up to the Temple Mount is directly responsible for the bloodshed that's going on in Israel. He said this at the funeral of the boy who was killed by the terrorists the other week, and said that those guys who go up to the Temple Mount, it's their direct fault that this boy was murdered. Mm-hmm. Rabbi David Yosef, the other son of Rabbi Vad Yosef, penned a letter to the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. He's the one who wrote this book. And he said, and he said what? Right. He said, so he said because of the that you must close the Temple Mount to Jews. And any Jew who goes up there, his prayer is a toeva, is an abomination, and is not accepted by Hashem. And all of the rabbis of the Jewish people have said you are not allowed to go up. The Rambam never said that. <laughs> if you go to the Temple Mount, there's a sign from the chief rabbinate of Israel saying, Jews are not allowed to enter the Temple Mount. The government of Israel believes the Jews are not allowed to go to the Temple Mount. Rabbi Yashiv, Rabbi Yashiv said that all the violence that happens in Israel are because of Jews who go to the Temple Mount. No. Haraf Kook said Jews are not allowed to go to the Temple Mount. My friends, we have a lot of big guns who said you cannot go to the Temple Mount. But why Rav Kook? Because Rav Kook's oh, Zionism... Others are understandable. Right? <laughs> <laughs> not understandable. <laughs> not consistent with his uh, line. Rav Kook was much more mainstream than you would like to think. I'm not taking away from his greatness. I mean, Mordechai Eliyahu penned four letters to the Prime Minister asking him to allow Jews to go to the Temple Mount. Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher, one of the giants of Ashkenazi Jewry, wanted to go pray at the Temple Mount. The Chavetz Chaim asked to go pray on the Temple Mount if he would make it to Israel. Rabbi Shlomo Goren, the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of the state of Israel, gave us a map of where you're allowed to go on the Temple Mount and where you're not allowed to go on the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Goren was promised by Moshe Dayan that he was going to build a synagogue on the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. 
and they lied to him. Lied, and they tricked him out. Some... They tricked him out of his Temple Mount. <laughs> the Lubavitcher Rebbe has a letter mm-hmm. in which he suggests going to pray, and he writes in his words, in the permitted places on the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. Meaning, there are permitted places on the Temple mm-hmm. Mount. Unpermitted. <clears throat> the list goes on of rabbis who allow people to go up to the Temple Mount. But somehow we've whitewashed this issue. All the rabbis say you're not going to go. Who are all the, when have you ever found that all the rabbis agree on anything? We should burn this book. How can you say that? that no, Chazali, don't it. burn books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very... <laughs> but let me ask you this question. If you would ask somebody on the Jewish... Are you allowed to go to the Temple Mount? No, we don't. Do you understand what it means when Jews don't go to the Temple Mount? We're ceding it to the Muslims and agreeing with their political Absolutely. Uh, point of view. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure, there are parts of the Temple Mount we're not allowed to go up to. According to some opinions, the Rambam went up to the Temple Mount. Rashi holds you're allowed to go to the Temple Mount. Not little guns. The Tosfot hold you're allowed to go to the Temple Mount. The Ravad, that he argues with the Rambam, he says the Temple Mount doesn't even have holiness today. You can walk everywhere in the Temple Mount. We don't agree with the Ravad. But there are definitely parts that are not part of the original Temple Mount. Or at least parts of the Temple Mount that weren't the part of the Kodesh or the Ezrati, or the, the different parts that you're not allowed to go to. Well, the, the thing is, the political reality, it's not just what, what uh, Judaism says about it, but the political reality that the Temple Mount has in Israel today, and its importance as a flashpoint. Sure. For it's a supercharged situation, because yeah. we've allowed it to be a supercharged situation. <clears throat> it's no different than Jews living in the Old City where the Muslims claim that we don't belong there. I lived in the right. old city. Right. It's no different than Jews living in Hebron, where they claim we don't belong. Hey, there's no different than the Marat and Machpelah. It's no different than the, all the places. Well, actually, there is a difference in, in the sense that it's considered to be holy. It isn't. I mean, Hebron is a place that uh, Arabs claim. Tomb of the Patriarchs for them is holy. It's a holy but site. it isn't holy in the same sense that the, that the, that the Mount is. I'm willing to do what we do in Hebron. You know, in Chevron, we're not allowed to pray at the Tomb of the Patriarchs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Tomb of the Patriarchs is under Muslim control. We have a little, little place we're allowed to go and pray. So let us have the Temple Mount. We'll have our little corner that we're allowed to go and say to him, I'm sorry. But you know, the fact that Jews are so obsessed with the Western Wall. Guys, we have a mountain. Well, we didn't have the mountains. We were obsessed with the Western Wall. What? The Arabs play soccer, and I used to watch them from yeah, my right, office. Right, right. They play soccer, and the it's holy for them. It's not holy for them for anything. <laughs> they do gymnastics. Someone just put out a video of a guy doing gymnastics on the Temple Mount. They throw rocks from there. They, 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 they throw their garbage, they put out their cigarettes. Right. Okay, what? That's holy for them. They call the gate the Dun Gate back right. in the day. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible thing that... And I'm not saying... I'm Dafka not saying out of a nationalistic cause. I'm saying... I have a, a weighed halakha cause. You want to say there are reasons not to go up. It's a supercharged political situation. The security forces in Israel are asking you to take a break from going up. I'm willing to, to weigh those situations. But for the Orthodox mainstream to paint the picture that Jews are not allowed to go to the Temple Mount and then market this to the secular Jewish world, tell it to the non-Jewish world, tell it to the Muslim community, and then what are we? So all our rabbis are chaplain. I once asked Rabbi parents, Rabbi, why do people say you can't go to the Temple Mount? He said, don't bother me with ridiculous questions. <laughs> Rabbi Peretz said, Rabbi Shlomo Goren, he said, you like him or not? Because yeah. he was a controversial figure. Yeah. He said, he made a map of the Temple Mount that you can't argue with. He said, all these rabbis who spoke, none of them spent the years of their life studying the Temple Mount like Rabbi Goren did. Mm. He made a map where you're allowed to walk, where you're not allowed to walk, where you're allowed to go, where you cannot go. The people who take you out from the Temple Institute, they're telling you where to go, where you're allowed to go. So these rabbis that are saying, no, how much of their life have they dedicated to the study of the Temple Mount? For them to all of a sudden become so great and tell everybody that it's forbidden. You want to know the absurd that last week? You know Merits? Have you heard of Merits before? Mm-hmm. You want to know Merits? is the most left-wing group that exists oh, almost as they have Merits. Merits in Jerusalem paid for ads all over Jerusalem saying, Dear fellow Orthodox Jews, Dear fellow? Dear fellow. fellow. All of our rabbis, our, Kol Rabotenu, all of our rabbis have forbid us from going to the Temple Mount. How dare you violate the words of our rabbis? <laughs> this is the absurd. How do these people eat pig? Orthodox Jews a member of Merit. 
Who? Name one. Exactly. They they eat pigs, they don't keep Yom Kippur, they violate Shabbat, yeah. but all of a sudden <laughs> comes the issue of a Temple Mount, right. you yeah, must listen to our rabbis. Sure. Which rabbis? The, the ones they chose, because they're also Jews, right? They choose only selective rabbis. And here's what I'm asking of you. When you look at ideas in Judaism, they seem, something's off about them, someone's making a really bold statement, that's probably because they're wrong. There's almost nothing in Judaism you could say all of our rabbis agreed on X. All of our rabbis agree you have to keep Shabbat. Yes, all of them. Yeah. Not all of them agree on what is constituting keeping Shabbat. All of our rabbis agree you have to keep kosher. That's a statement you can make, because the Torah makes it. Not all of our rabbis agree what is the definition of kosher, what is kosher, what is not kosher, how is it kosher. <laughs> you can't stand up and say, all of our rabbis say X, Y, and Z. For example, as much as I believe that one is allowed to eat milk, drink milk, that's not Chalav Yisrael in the modern day term, I cannot get up and say, all of our rabbis said it's okay. Not all of our rabbis said it's okay. Many of our rabbis said it's a big averat to drink such milk. But when it comes to making decisions, you have to choose between opinions. And therefore I understand those who go one way, and I understand those who go the other way. But you can't make a statement like, all of the rabbis. Yeah. All of our rabbis say you can't do autopsies. All of the rabbis say you can't do organ donations. All of the rabbis say that it's a very hard process to convert. All of our rabbis... What do all of our rabbis do? We have to sit down and reanalyze things today. They have a list on the rabbis? All the rabbis, they have a list. <laughs> are women allowed to vote? Mm. Where? Where? Are Israel? No, according to Jewish law. Uh-huh. Does a woman have a right to vote? Isn't it Is the same vote as vote a court? Elections for the mayor of the you town. For anybody? Yeah. yeah Why not? Rav Cook said like a one per one vote per family, but the whole family. Rav Cook to be held that women are not allowed to vote. Yeah, he said okay. one vote per family. Although his his ideal was that one family unit should vote, okay. that a husband should vote in the name of his whole family. There shouldn't be two opinions under one household. But even when Rav Cook was pushed to say, so what if the vote doesn't go per family, it goes per person? Can women hold public office? Rav Cook said no. <laughs> because the, the, the Rambam yeah. the Rambam says that a lady can't hold public office seemingly that's what the Rambam says Rav Uziel it's very interesting how the Sephardic people who are normally very traditional in this regard Rav Uziel penned the whole letter saying I don't understand where you got the answer no from a lady is being the decision is being made about her life about things that she's going to have to do with that she's, she's going to have to struggle with so why is she not allowed to vote he said if a lady takes a position of authority since the Rambam was talking about a position of authority where, like most positions of authority, it was forced upon a community to accept a certain person. It was forced upon a country to accept a certain king. And for whatever reason, the Rambam felt, like the Gemara, that you cannot force a lady to be in a position of authority over everybody else. Yeah, discuss this with me at a different time. Rav Uziel said, but what happens when people vote for a lady to be their prime minister? People vote for a lady to be their judge. People vote for a lady to be their mayor. Says, what grounds do you have to forbid this if they chose it? Sejabu Ziel, your model doesn't adapt to the way we're operating as the state of Israel today. Mm. And when we look at this, there are rabbis who dealt with these topics seriously. You have to search them out, you have to look at what they're saying and say they have sources also. It's not so far fetched. Orthodox Jews, we're not so stuck like we think we're stuck. We're not so orthodox. We're Torah observers. We follow halakha. We follow a system that's been moving and moving and moving since it was put into play by God and Moshe Rabbeinu. It doesn't keep us stuck anywhere. We're not stuck in time. We don't all have to wear black and white and you know penguin suits. But we, we definitely have to pledge allegiance to the system of halakha, to God's system of halakha, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always constantly bringing new things to the world. So, does, so do we. Not things that change. Things that adapt, things that work with the world. We don't compromise on ourselves for the world. But not all the things that we're so busy sticking our guns up for are worth fighting for. But we can't do these decisions on our own. We have to find Talmudic Chamim who are willing to guide us in this path. So B'zat Hashem, we'll work together to find those Talmudic Chamim. Have a beautiful evening. Tomorrow we'll continue the laws of Nitzat